Okay, welcome to everyone joining us for this evening's Nutshell discussion. If it's your first Nutshell, you're really in for a treat this evening. Um, my name is Kelly Gilbo. I'm one of the two outreach coordinators for the Savannah Institute. And before we get started, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the Savannah Institute, if it's your first time joining us. We're a nonprofit organization that's focused on research and education about agroforestry. And this means working with trees, which produce crops, which help make farms more profitable resilient and healing for the environment. This can take many far farms, uh, depending on the farm and of the goals. A lot of our work is doing research in cooperation with farmers. We connect farmers and scientists at universities and at other organizations. We host events at farms through field days. We have a perennial farm gathering each year. That's coming up in early December, so keep an eye out for that invitation. And this is all with the aim of helping farmers share what they're learning with each other and more broadly. Of course, we also develop educational resources, and all of these can be found on our website, which is savannahinstitute.org. Definitely check that out. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Hegner Family Foundation and North Central Stair. Just everyone, FYI, when you log on, I mute your mic so we don't hear your background. Uh, so back to our sponsors. Without our sponsor, we wouldn't be able to bring you these discussions for free. So thanks for that. Uh, now, thank you again to all of you for joining us. Uh, just a few logistics. If you're joining us from a computer, uh, you'll, I want to invite you to share all your questions and comments during the presentation in the chat box of the platform. So on the little screen that's the green pop-up uh, with the free conference call platform, you see, you'll see a little bubble and you uh, can feel free to type in your questions or comments throughout uh, and we will try to address them at the end Q&A session. And I'll be monitoring these throughout, make sure that they are addressed at that end time. Uh, and so after, when we get to about 45 after, uh, Tom, our speaker, uh, will turn it over to the Q&A portion of the evening. And so at that point, you all will be able to turn on your mics and ask whatever questions you have. Uh, and so hopefully that's an engaging conversational time. So without further ado, we're honored to welcome our presenter for the evening, Tom Wall. Uh, Tom was born and raised in Iowa, graduated from Iowa State University with a Bachelor of Science in Fisheries and Wildlife Biology. He farms full-time with his wife, Kathy Dice, in Louisa County, Iowa. Uh, they grow chestnuts, heart nuts, persimmons, pawpaws, and a wide variety of other tree cro crops in a perennial polyculture system. And Tom's going to share all about chestnuts with us this evening. So without, with that, I'll turn it over to Tom to get started. We're going to be talking about chestnuts, commercial chestnut production. And when I talk about chestnuts, I am talking specifically about Chinese chestnuts, not any of the minor species like European and Japanese. Um, uh, chestnuts are members of the beech family, Phagaceae, along with the oaks. They're not related to horse chestnuts or water chestnuts. Uh, just, the chestnut is a medium-sized tree reaching 35 to 40 feet tall and wide <coughs> by year 20. They tend toward annual <coughs> heavy bearing, unlike most other nut crops, which uh, tend toward biennial bearing, meaning they'll produce a good crop one year and then skip a year or two or three before having another good crop. Chestnuts tend to have a, a full crop every year. The nutritional makeup of chestnuts is unique among nuts. You're blocking my light. <coughs> um, they're the only nut considered fat-free. They're the only nut allowed in a low-fat diet. Um, They're composed mostly of complex carbohydrates and have a moderate amount of protein and almost no fat. Uh, other nuts are mostly fat and protein and almost no carbohydrates, so they're like a direct opposite of other nuts. They're also used very differently from other nuts. Uh, chestnuts are used uh, just about any way that you can use a fruit, a vegetable, or a grain, and about the only thing they're not treat treated like is a nut. Uh, so 
why grow chestnuts? First of all, there's a large market. Um, they're the third most important nut in the world in terms of demand, behind only coconuts and peanuts, ahead of all the other nuts like almonds and walnuts and pecans, macadamia nuts, cashews. It's the third most important food crop in China in terms of economic importance, behind only rice and wheat and ahead of corn and soybeans. There's a large U.S. market, and it's been doubling every 10 years. Uh, customers will drive hundreds of miles to get chestnuts. We have customers driving from to southeast Iowa, from Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha, Sioux City, Iowa, Fargo, North Dakota, and Minneapolis. Uh, three years ago, we had a family drive all the way to southeast Iowa to our farm from south Florida, 1,200 miles one way just to pick chestnuts. Despite uh, heavy promotion of chestnuts as a commercial crop for about the last 40 years, the acreage of chestnuts has only been increasing by about 100 acres a year. So we went from about zero acres in 1980 to around 4,000 acres today. But it would take t between 20 and 30,000 acres of chestnuts in the ground and bearing in order to produce the demand that we had in the year 2000. It would take approximately 200 years at the rate chestnut trees are being planted right now just to get enough trees in the ground for that. So there's really no uh, foreseeable possibility of overproduction of chestnuts. Uh, chestnuts bring excellent prices, uh, even when they're compared to other high-value crops like pecans or almonds or hazelnuts. Um, Chestnut Growers, uh, a chestnut cooperative in southeast Iowa, uh, is paying growers $1.30 a pound for small size nuts this fall, uh, $2.50 a pound for medium sized nuts, and $2.40 a pound for large and extra large nuts. Uh, these are wholesale prices paid to growers. And you might notice the premium price is paid not to the extra-large nuts, but to the medium-sized nuts. And that's because the medium-sized nuts are the ones most in demand. In fact, uh, the last year that I managed the cooperative, we had a four-year waiting list for medium-sized nuts. Organic growers in Iowa are receiving 650 a pound for their nuts, and they're selling everything they can grow. Uh, chestnuts retail from anywhere from oh, 3 to $14 a pound. Chestnuts are heavy bears. On the best Midwest soils, ch Chinese chestnuts produce up to 5,000 pounds of nuts per acre. I'll go over site selection and planting now. Uh, chestnuts do require a well-drained soil. They will absolutely not tolerate poor drainage. They need soil on the acid side of the pH scale, uh, ideally 5.5 to 6.5. Uh, they will grow best on deep, fertile, moist, but well-drained soils. Uh, frost pockets should be avoided, as well as extremely exposed windy sites, although uh, because chestnuts leaf out 
late and flower even later, they can actually produce a crop in frost pockets where other uh, tree crops like apples, pears, peaches, plums, cherries, apricots would fail because they leaf out and flower early and, and get nailed by frost. Chestnut nursery stock should be planted at the same depth it was grown in the nursery. Uh, you need to avoid the temptation to plant it just a little deeper than it was growing in the nursery like, like you p would plant a tomato. Uh, that will kill a chestnut tree. The roots need to go in the ground, but the trunk, uh, all of the trunk, needs to be out of the ground. Uh, the trunk of a Chinese chestnut seedling is green, kind of an olive green, and the point where the trunk meets the root system, there's a color change to a rusty, rusty red color. Um, that's the point that should be right at ground level. No soil should ever touch the green part of the trunk of a chestnut tree at planting. Uh, only soil from the planting hole should be used to backfill the hole, not fertilizer, not compost. <coughs> Five-foot-tall, ventilated, well-ventilated tree shelters should be applied to protect the trees from deer and rabbits. Um, the tree shelters also reduce mortality. To make the trees grow faster and start bearing nuts years earlier, uh, so with a tree shelter, a chestnut will begin producing nuts two to four years after planting. If you just put a cage around it to protect it from deer and rabbits, it will take six to ten years to see the first nuts. Uh, another thing that the tree shelters do is uh, eliminate practically all the requirement for pruning. A, a chestnut tree needs to be pruned up high enough so that you can get under the tree with a mower because you cannot harvest chestnuts uh, from tall grass. So you need to get under the tree to mow, and to do that you have to prune. And a net Chinese chestnut's natural growth form is rather bushy. They tend to put out a lot of limbs at low level, and it takes a tremendous amount of pruning unless you use a five-foot tree shelter. But the tree shelter eliminates the pruning. Now, any one of these benefits received from the five-foot tree shelter would make them worthwhile. Uh, but when you combine them all together, it makes them absolutely indispensable. Uh, effective weed control is absolutely necessary to get chestnut trees established. Uh, Mowing by itself is not effective. Mulching by itself is not effective. And landscape fabric by itself is not effective. But if you combine uh, a three-foot square of landscape fabric around the base of each tree topped with two to four inches of coarse wood chip mulch, that makes very effective weed control. Uh, it will add about $1,000 an acre to the cost of a project, though. Uh, a low-cost, uh, very effective uh, alternative to the landscape fabric and mulch is oust herbicide, or, or the chemical name is sulfometeron methyl. Uh, it is very cheap. It costs about 30 cents per acre to apply, or about a dollar's worth of oust will treat about 2,000 trees. It's, uh, it will... Keep the ground around the base of a tree weed-free for a year, even longer in, a, in the case of a dry year. Uh, it does need to be expertly applied uh, by someone who knows how to apply, how to, how to calibrate a sprayer and apply herbicides. Uh, if you don't know how to do that yourself, it would be worth your while to hire somebody like a consulting forester who does know how to apply an oust herbicide. The ground cover between the trees is also very important. Uh, it, it's important that it be compatible with trees. Uh, 
a ground cover that makes good hay or forage is not going to be compatible with trees. A ground cover that is compatible with trees is not going to be tall enough for cutting hay and not very productive for grazing. Uh, a lot of different ground covers will work, but the one I recommend the most is a mix of turf-type perennial ryegrass at 10 pounds per acre, fine-leaved fescue at 10 pounds per acre, and this can be creeping red fescue, uh, chewing fescue, or hard fescue. There may be a couple of other fine-leaved fescues also. Uh, and then two pounds per acre of Dutch white clover. This will make a mix that will prevent soil erosion, prevent other weed species from encroaching, uh, yet it doesn't get very tall, doesn't need mowing very often. You might be able to get by with just uh, mowing it three times per year, <clears throat> and it doesn't compete strongly against tree roots. You still do need to keep the area right around the base of newly planted trees uh, free even of this ground cover, though. Uh, spacing. I recommend 20 feet by 20 feet spacing. That means rows 20 feet apart and trees 20 feet apart within the row. Uh, this is a rather controversial topic, though. A lot of people think that spacing is too close. Uh, but if you talk to people in China, they plant chestnuts at 3 feet by 7 feet and get twice the production that we get. Now, at 20 feet by 20 foot spacing, uh, mm -hmm. the trees will need to be thinned by the time they reach 20 years old. Uh, they'll need to be thinned to 40 by 40. Another thinning will need to take place somewhere around year 50. The trees will be, need to be thinned down to 80 by 80. And then one final thinning, probably around 500 years down the road to 160 by 160. And that, that's, that spacing should be good for the next 1,000 to 1,500 years. Uh, I know somebody had a question about whether chestnuts would make a good yard or shade tree. And the answer is absolutely not. Chestnuts do not make good yard trees uh, because of the uh, very prolific burr production. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with sand burrs, uh, chestnuts produce something very much like a sand burr, only the size of a baseball, and they produce hundreds of them. Um, if you plant a chestnut tree in your yard, you will never be able to go barefoot again. You'll never be able to lay in the grass and look up at the clouds. Um, most people who plant chestnut trees in their yard cut them down as soon as they start uh, dropping burrs. They don't make a good yard tree. Um, another question was about grafted trees versus seedling trees. Uh, in zone 6B and farther south, grafted Chinese chestnut trees perform as much as 80% as well as seedling trees. And at and that is e economically viable. But it, as you proceed northward from Zone 6B, the performance of grafted chestnuts drops off very sharply. And by the time you get to Zone 5A, uh, grafted chestnuts average about 10 or no, about 15 to 18 percent of the production of seedling trees. The seedling trees will produce assuming they come from good parents with good genetics. Seedling trees will produce nuts every bit as large and every bit as high in quality as grafted trees, but they will produce five to six times more of them. Uh, in Zone 5B and farther north, grafted trees are good for one thing and one thing only, and that is producing superior seedlings but the seedlings are the ones that are good for nut production. The grafted trees are good for breeding. Cultivars, cultivars. I have a, a short
short list of recommended cultivars, and uh, when I when I say the cultivars, I'm talking about using these as parent trees, not uh, trying to grow these as grafted trees. Uh, Ching, peach, Gideon, Mossbarger, Auburn Super, Shotgun, and Luval's Monster seedlings make my my short list. There are other good ones, but uh, these are exceptionally good trees, and they make exceptionally good parent trees. Seedlings of these are known to produce high-quality nuts and, and lots of them. If you are in zone 5A or 4B, um, the choices are a bit narrower, but Luval's Monster and Mossbarger are still good choices for zone 5 a and 4B. Uh, also, uh, chestnuts derived from the badger set trees, ones that produce large nuts, are also viable in, in zone, possibly even as far north as zone 4A, southern zone 4A. Chestnuts to avoid planting. Uh, at the very top of my list is the variety Colossal, which is a Japanese European hybrid. Um, it has a lot of problems. It, it, it is a vigorous tree, grows fast, gets to be a big tree fast, produces a lot of nuts, and they're large size. But uh, the Colossal um, is not blight resistant. It's not very cold hardy. And the nut quality has a long way to go to reach mediocre. Um, most of the customers for Colossal Chestnuts are uh, Anglo-Americans who don't know chestnuts very well. And uh, Americans really make poor chestnut customers. Uh, when they do buy chestnuts, they buy one pound at Christmas time, whereas people who know and love chestnuts buy them by the hundreds of pounds. But the Colossal Chestnut is not uh, attractive to the kind of people who buy large quantities of chestnuts. In fact, they laugh at Americans for buying them. Uh, the Dunstan hybrids uh, are viable in zone 6B and farther south. They start getting marginal in 6A, and they are totally unsuited to zone 5B or farther north. Uh, they are developed in Florida, and they have Florida cold hardiness, and uh, they just cannot withstand... Our, our severe winters this far north. Uh, anything from a slick, glossy nursery catalog should be avoided. Uh, the types of nurseries that put those out tend to seek out uh, seed sources of the very smallest chestnuts they can find because they cost less per pound and they get more uh, seedlings per pound that they buy. So that's that's what they purchase for seed stock and that's what they grow and when those trees grow up they produce the tiny nuts that have a relatively low market value. Also any field grown bare root chestnuts. Uh, some trees can be grown in in the field and dug up bare root and transplant just fine but chestnuts really aren't on that list. Um, I've spent literally thousands of dollars on bare root chestnut nursery stock over the years, and I don't have a single surviving tree from that. Okay. Harvesting. Chestnuts worldwide are mostly harvested by hand, but Americans don't really get into that kind of activity, so we like to have some kind of machine to harvest chestnuts. Uh, one thing that we've tried is uh, a thing called a bag of nut. Uh, it works really well on round nuts, but chestnuts have one or two flat sides, so they hug the ground a little closer than the round nuts, and uh, the bag of nut really didn't work very well. It, in three or four passes, it would get maybe 60% of the nuts. Another thing we tried was a lawn sweeper. Uh, 
the lawn sweeper did a really good job picking up the burrs, but uh, um, picked um, uh, almost no nuts up. Uh, the thing we found that really works the best are, are nut wizards. It's a wire basket mounted on the end of a pole that rolls on the ground, and when the basket rolls over a nut, the wires in the basket spread apart, the nuts pop inside, and then they can be dumped in a five-gallon bucket. Uh, you can harvest nuts all day long with a nut wizard without ever bending over once. Even a skinny little girl can use a nut wizard with ease. Uh, we have gone to 100% UPEC in our chestnut operation. We let the customers do the harvesting. We loan them the nut wizards, and they do the picking, and they are very happy to do it. Uh, a good picker can pick two to 300 pounds a day in, in just a few hours with a nut wizard. Uh, some people might ask about... Uh, a more complex machinery to harvest chestnuts, and we looked at some of that. Uh, we looked at uh, a Savage Pecan Harvester, which is a, uh, a drum with rubber fingers that sweep the nuts up off the ground. They don't work very well on chestnuts, though. Uh, another thing we looked at is a FACMA Chestnut Harvester, uh, a machine made in Italy, uh, and designed very specifically for chestnut harvesting. And it does work, but it also picks up the burrs, sticks, rocks, leaves, dirt, deer droppings, and a lot of other things. So once the chestnuts are harvested with that, they have to, be, have, to have the trash separated out, and then the nuts have to be sanitized. Uh, a couple of other steps that aren't necessary with a nut wizard. Also, when I was talking with the, the salesman for the FACMA machine, um, I asked him how many acres per hour or hours per acre the machine could do, and I calculated that five people with a nut wizard could stay ahead of that machine at a fraction of the cost and w without having to do all the cleaning. But anyway, back to, uh, back to you pick chestnuts. Um, we used to ha harvest all our chestnuts ourselves. I think it was four years ago we went to the UPIC, and w we will never go back. Uh, the pick-your-own-chestnuts eliminates the harvesting cost, the sanitation cost, refrigeration cost, packaging cost, shipping cost, and advertising costs. Uh, our advertising is 100% word of mouth among our customers. And with that method of advertising, we have a uh, customer list or a waiting list with 257 names on it, and we have the ability to serve approximately 25 to 30 per year. So we have about 10 times more customers than we can serve with you pick and that was with no effort on our part no advertising no. Um, we might get interrupted here we have a severe thunderstorm bearing down on us but we'll keep it up as long as we can uh, here's a range map of where I think Chinese chestnuts and hybrid chestnuts can be grown in Iowa. Yeah, you can extrapolate that for other parts of the Midwest. Uh, you might notice uh, the northwest corner of Iowa is excluded. That's not because it's too cold there, but because the soils there tend to be poorly drained and also 
too alkaline or too high in pH for chestnuts. But there are places in northwest Iowa where chestnuts can be grown, and even in south, the southeast corner of South Dakota, uh, southern Minnesota, southern Wisconsin, western Nebraska, western Kansas, all, all of Missouri uh, are all within a range where chestnuts could be grown commercially. Um, pests and diseases of chestnuts are fairly numerous. Deer, rabbits, mice, gophers, all can damage or kill young trees. Uh, deer, mice, chipmunks, squirrels, raccoons, and, and turkeys will all prey on the nuts if you let them. But most of the chestnuts fall between about uh, well, noon and 6 p.m. Uh, and if you get them picked up, all picked up by sunset, there's really very little on the ground for the deer, raccoons, and and night predators, and if there are people walking around picking up chestnuts. Uh, there are a couple of insect pests of chestnuts that can be serious. One is a gall wasp. Uh, it's a very tiny gnat-sized wasp that attacks the buds of chestnuts, and they can cause severe damage on chestnuts. Uh, there aren't very many in the Midwest yet. Michigan and Ohio have gall wasps. But they aren't, aren't in Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, or Missouri yet. Uh, Japanese beetles can be a problem. They do chew on chestnut leaves, although chestnuts are definitely not one of their favorites. Um, they can be kept off of chestnuts with a treatment of neem oil, or uh, if you want a cheaper solution, uh, the insecticide 7 is very effective. Uh, the single worst insect pest of chestnuts are the chestnut weevils. These are beetles that uh, lay their eggs on the, on the nuts and the larvae hatch and burrow into the nut and uh, consume the kernel. Uh, they don't really hurt the nut very much, but for some reason the consumers have pretty much a zero tolerance for little white grubs in their food. So if you have chestnut weevils, you have to manage them so that uh, they aren't disturbing your customers. Uh, there are a couple of ways they can be managed. Uh, there are insecticides labeled for chestnut weevil control now. Uh, but just getting all the chestnuts picked up in promptly not leaving them on the ground will go a long way to reduce the weevil population. Also, if you can turn pigs loose under the chestnut trees at the end of harvest, they will find every last nut, even the ones that get buried by mice and squirrels, and that they will eat the nuts, weevil larvae and all, and that breaks the weevil's life cycle. works even better if you can turn chickens loose under the chestnuts in the spring to catch any that happen to escape the pigs. There are a few chestnut diseases to be concerned about. Uh, chestnut blight affects pretty much all chestnut species, but the Chinese chestnut is by far the most resistant to that disease. And uh, out of a thousand trees on our farm, I've only seen <coughs> chestnut blight on one single tree, and uh, it's a sublethal infection. It produces some blight cankers, but the cankers heal over, and the tree just keeps on growing and producing nuts. Uh, Phytophthora can be a problem on chestnuts. It's mainly a problem on poorly drained soils, and again, Chinese chestnut is highly resistant to Phytophthora. 
if you grow Chinese chestnuts on well-drained soil, that disease is probably not going to be a problem. Oak wilt can affect chestnuts, uh, but it uh, does not seem to be a serious problem. Thank you. Oh, I'm out of time. You have 20 minutes until 7. Till 7? 20, 6 Okay. Um, I guess I'm just about out of time, but so I'm going to summarize. Um, Iowa, northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, southern Minnesota, and northern Missouri right now are in a sweet spot for chestnut production because they have no uh, weevils or chestnut gall wasps. Um, in those locations, uh, income potential from chestnuts can be $10,000 an acre. If you add additional plants <coughs> under the chestnut, such as plant pawpaws, Beneath the chestnuts and uh, a berry crop such as honeyberries in between the rows, you could boost that to twenty or even thirty thousand dollars an acre. In other parts of the country, in the east and the south, where chestnut gall wasps and chestnut weevils are abundant, um, it's a lot more expensive and less profitable to grow chestnuts. So I guess I need to leave time for questions. Yeah, we have about 15 minutes left, and so we can certainly fill that with lots of questions. Um, but thanks, Tom, okay. first of all, for all that all that information. What a wealth of information. Um, I will say, first of all, I, I think probably because of the weather, there there's definitely a lag with the slides and whatnot. So all the audience, I want you to know that um, I'll be sending a follow-up email um, this week with this presentation as well as the slides, the PDF of all the slides. So you'll be able to go back and um, align the visuals with what Tom is sharing. So uh, hopefully that will put everything together for you. Uh, but on my end, I am going to enable. So uh, those of you on a computer should now see um, uh, queue. You can request to get in the queue uh, to ask a question, and once you're, it's your turn, your, your mic will turn on and you'll be able to ask your question uh, and have a conversation with Tom. If you're on a phone, then you should dial star six to get in the queue. Um, and so we've got a couple questions already. Uh, let's see. So let me unmute Tom and Nick C. You should be live. Nick, can you hear us? Nick C, are you, let's see, okay, Nick has disappeared, so we'll go with Taylor. Okay, Taylor, are you live? Can you hear me? Yes, Taylor, yep, you're here. I hear you. Great. Hello, uh, I got a question for you, Tom. Uh, that was an awesome presentation. Um, I live in Tennessee where there are chestnut trees planted all around and people do not pick them up and so we have pretty bad weevil populations in the nuts. How far would I have to plant an orchard away to kind of be in like a quarantine zone so that weevils from other trees aren't getting into my orchard? Well, they're probably going to get there eventually no matter where you go, but right now, like I said earlier, uh, Probably uh, central Illinois would be the, the nearest location to you where you could be sure to escape weevils at least temporarily. Okay, thanks Taylor for that question. We've got another in the chat box from Patrick. Uh, wondering, is there a warm water soaking method that's reasonable for dealing with weevils? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Greg Miller has uh, come up with a, a method of, well, it's more of a hot water soaking. Um, I would have to look up the exact details, but I, I think it was a, a 120 degree temperature water 
for exactly 20 minutes, and uh, uh, any deviation in uh, a degree or two outside of that range or uh, deviation in minutes uh, will, will not work or, or cannot be counted on to work. So 20 minutes at 120 degrees will kill all the weevil larvae. Okay, wonderful. Any other questions from our audience? Uh, Tammy's wondering where can I find oust herbicide? Um, it's very easy to find on the internet. Just do a search for oust or sulfometeron. Uh, sulfometeron is uh, S U L F O M E T R O N, and then methyl is M E T H Y L. <laughs> That then, that then you after the T after the T. Okay, great. I think we might be typing what? that in the chat box. <laughs> and then O after the R. O after the R. And then methyl M E T H Y L. Um, with a space in between. Okay. I think we're getting the spelling up now. Okay, great. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no E, uh, except with no E uh, after. It, it was private. <laughs> All right, great. So that that specific source will be. Hey, I see another question about raising the tree tubes. If the tree tubes are well ventilated, they don't need to be raised in the fall. If they're not well ventilated, they shouldn't be on the trees in the first place. Okay, great. There were some other, there were a couple of questions before here. Um, you mentioned honeyberries as understory with pawpaws. What's the latest on productivity on the commercial scale and the best varietals to plant? Um, well, the I can only speculate right now. I have a bunch in the ground that I'm testing, but it'll be a few years before I can come to any uh, definitive conclusions. But um, supposedly the best varieties can produce 8 to 12 pounds per bush. And, uh, and the, the best varieties, in my opinion, are the Boreal series from the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Boreal Blizzard, Boreal Beast, and Boreal Beauty. They produce berries much larger than what used to be considered a large size honeyberry just a few years ago. And better flavored. Great. And Kevin is wondering, how did you get customers initially for your UPIC model? You mentioned how that what? at this point. How did you get customers initially for the the UPIC model? Uh, you um, mentioned that at this point it's word of okay. mouth, but initially. How yeah, it was it was almost forced on me. I, I had <clears throat> some Bosnian customers who begged me to let them pick their own, and I was very reluctant. I was afraid of liability and afraid our insurance wouldn't cover it, but they were good customers, and I didn't want to disappoint them, so I said, go ahead, but don't tell anybody. And within days, I had a list of 20 people who wanted to do it. And the following year, I had a list of 70-some, and uh, now it's 250-some. And it's all by word of mouth. So... If you let people of a community who grew up eating chestnuts know you have them, they will come and they will want to pick them themselves. Great. Uh, we also, there was a question prior about uh, spacing of chestnuts and silvo pasture situations, uh, but you mentioned that the ground cover that you recommend isn't great for grazing or, you know. Anything. Yeah, there, there's another problem with that, too, though. A, a bigger problem is the, the Food Safety Modernization Act of 2012 um, uh, 
And I, I could go on about that for days, but the short of it is um, for a crop like chestnuts that drops to the ground and is consumed by humans, you would have to have the animals moved off of that by no later than mid-May uh, if you're anticipating your nuts to start dropping in mid-September. And then you'd have to keep them off until mid-October. So mid-May to mid-October is pretty much about 99% of the grazing season. So federal regulations would prevent you in, from uh, having animals during the grazing season under chestnut trees, unless you were doing it strictly for animal feed. But if you're planning on selling chestnuts to, for human consumption, it just wouldn't work out. Okay. I'm wondering if uh, other chestnut farmers in in the Midwest or the region or your area are seeing just as much success with customer base and that and market demand. Um. Yeah. Uh, most of the growers in Iowa are selling their nuts to the local cooperative, and so they have the, the harvesting costs, but uh, then they don't have to worry about all the other things. Uh, and then a few of the growers surrounding me are starting to adopt uh, Pick Your Own. I, I, I kind of push my excess customers off on them if they'll take them. And uh, everyone who's tried it has loved to pick your own and have no interest in going back to harvesting them themselves. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Remember, you can click the button to get in the queue or dial star six if you're on your phone. I think we've run through most all of the chat box questions. And all the questions sent previously. Okay, here's another one. What size pots do you plant the nuts in when you do plant seedlings? Um, I use a, a pot that's uh, nine and a half inches tall and four inches across at the top. But also, it's really important using a pot that size to prevent root spiraling because root spiraling will will ruin a tree and you can't fix it uh, once it happens. So I cut the corners off of the bottoms of the pots so that when the roots reach the bottom of the pot, uh, <clears throat> as soon as they reach a corner, they hit hit air and air prune. Um, <clears throat> yeah, these are square pots, uh, n not round, Kathy's pointing out. So they have co four corners at the bottom. Yeah, I would not recommend round pots at all for growing chestnuts, ec except for there's a special kind of pot made by a company called Lace Bark Incorporated called a root maker pot that is specially designed on the inside to prevent root spiraling. And, and those are round, but those will also prevent root spiraling. But that's more important than the pot size. Great. And from Graham, uh, is early production a reasonable indicator of eventual mature production, uh, specifically thinking about planting higher density seedlings rather than culling? Um, generally, yes, but not always. There are There are varieties that are kind of slow to come into into production, but then once they reach about 15 or 20 years of age, they they're just as productive as uh, other trees that that were heavy bearing at a very young age. But generally speaking, uh, a tree that starts bearing young will be a heavy bearer uh, as a mature tree. Uh, although there is also a hazard in that uh, those trees that come into bearing at a very young age 
even if they're producing very large nuts at a young age. If they become very heavy bearing trees at maturity, they might bear small nuts. They might overbear, produce too many nuts, and and then the nut size might be small. So, so another question I see, how many years can chestnuts produce nuts? <clears throat> um, well, their maximum lifespan seems to be around 2,000 years. Uh, there are lots of chestnuts over a thousand years old that are still bearing heavy crop nuts. Are there any more questions? Yes, anyone from the audience? That's, there were lots of questions. So, great one more from Taylor. <laughs> what was the desired, oh, the desired pH? pH range? Uh, 5.5 to 6.5 is ideal. Uh, they will they will tolerate a lower pH than that better than they'll tolerate a higher pH than that. So, uh, they'll they'll grow even in at 4.5, but they won't they won't tolerate seven or above. All right. Well, if we've come to the end of our questions, uh, well, let's see. You mentioned boil honey. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's um, a question. Maybe, yeah. maybe I, I mentioned honeyberry. Maybe that's what. Mm. Oh, oh bo boil, boil beauty, boil beast, and boil blizzard. The, uh, not not boil, but boreal. B o r e a l. Uh, Where can you order? Where can you order? Um, yeah, the the boreal series of honeyberries can be ordered from a company called Honeyberry USA, located in northern Minnesota. Okay, great. And I any of those. Uh, links, I'll include a link to that in the follow-up email, um, so I can include this Honeyberry USA. Um, maybe um, one last question. Uh, yeah, uh, we used to use a lawn sweeper to pick up burrs, uh, but uh, last year we purchased a, a rather expensive mower with a vacuum attachment and grass catcher on it, and that works a whole lot better than a lawn sweeper. It, it gets 95% of the burrs in a single pass. But the lawn sweeper will work if you can't afford uh, such an expensive lawn mower. Great. Oh, oh, and the question was every day. Yeah, we we don't sweep up the burrs every day. We we usually uh, let about half of the nuts fall from a tree, and then sweep up the burrs, and then just once under each tree at, at, at about halfway through the harvest for that particular tree. All right. What a wealth of information. Uh, any final words, Tom, or uh, things that you'd like to leave our audience with? Um, well, Oh, um, we have a, a document called the, the Chestnut Growers Primer available on our website at redfernfarm.com that you can download for free. I think it's about a 16-page little booklet with most of the information that we covered tonight on it. Great. Well, I will also link that in the follow-up email then. Um, and hopefully, yeah, all this great information to our attendees. Uh, okay, well, we're right at time then, and there's lightning here, so I think before we lose power, we'll, we'll head out. But um, thanks again to everyone who joined us. Um, like I keep mentioning, I'll send this follow-up email, and I want to say that in that will also be a, um, a survey, uh, just a feedback form on how these nutshells go, any suggestions you have for us. 
anything at all you'd like us to know at the Savannah Institute. Uh, and we've announced our whole fall nutshell series, so I hope you've checked out the rest of the speakers up, up until December. We've got a great lineup, and I hope you can join us for future nutshells. Thanks again, Tom and Kathy, for your information and your expertise. Uh, You're welcome. We really appreciate your time. All right. All right. Everyone have a good night, then.